So we've considered um, some introductory biotechnology techniques, including digestion of DNA with restriction enzymes and the separation of restriction enzyme fragments on, via gel electrophoresis. Let's examine a few more uh, techniques now um, in manipulating DNA and, bio and biotechnological approaches. So <clears throat> let's say you, we wanted to uh, clone a fragment of DNA from a uh, particular source of interest, a, a gene of interest, or um, a DNA of interest, let's say from some organism, humans, let's say, or whatever experimental organism you might be manipulating. Well, you can cut that DNA, shown in green here, with the restriction enzyme, and also cut a plasmid that has particular genetic markers in it. So plasmids have been manipulated so as to provide uh, fruitful, useful uh, cloning vectors. And one gene that is often found in plasmids used to clone DNA is a um, antibiotic resistance gene. So these genes, anti, oops, sorry, antibiotic resistance gene. And that antibiotic resistance gene can confer via its protein product resistant to, um, resistance to um, a particular antibiotic, ampicillin, for example, um, a uh, something like penicillin, or streptomycin, another, another uh, antibiotic resistance gene that is found in plasmids, is, um, can be engineered into plasmids, is a streptomycin resistance gene, or a canamycin resistance gene. In this case, we're going to consider our red gene here in, our, in this plasmid, we're going to consider that to be a and an, a resistance gene that confers bacteria uh, that confers resistance to the to the um, antibiotic ampicillin. It confers resistance uh, to to that antibiotic when bacteria harbor this particular plasmid. And then there's another gene here called the LACZ gene that is a very useful gene in that it reports its activity to us. The LACZ gene you'll remember comes from the lactose operon in bacteria. And the LAC-Z genes enco encodes the enzyme you may remember from our study of the LAC operon. It encodes the enzyme beta-galactosidase, beta-gal. And beta-gal can convert a colorless substance called X-gal, which is a lactose analog, into a colored, usually it's a blue precipitate. So. So bacteria that would harbor this particular plasmid shown here at the beginning, if you were to put that in a bacterium, here's the bacterium, here's the chromosome, and if, if that bacteria were to incorporate this plasmid and that plasmid could replicate, this bacterium would, in the presence of X-gal, produce a blue colony when grown on petri dishes because the LACZ gene would be expressed, beta-galactosidase protein would be present, and in the presence of X-gal, those bacteria, those bacterial colonies that are derived from bacteria that have this particular plasmid in them would turn blue. So we call X-gal, um, the X-gal gene, that is a reporter. It reports its activity to us by, in this case, producing a colored a colony when the appropriate substrate is given to the bacteria. Also, because of the, uh, because this plasmid has both the LACZ gene and an ampicillin resistance gene, in the presence of ampicillin, if ampicillin is present, these bacteria will grow because they will be resistant to that antibiotic. So, this plasmid then is very useful as a cloning vector. So let's see what would happen. If we cut with a restriction enzyme that digests the LACZ gene, that cuts the LACZ gene in the middle, and cut foreign DNA, DNA of interest, let's say we have some gene of interest here, GOI, a gene of interest, gene of interest, and that gene of interest is cut with the same restriction enzyme, it can be inserted via um, annealing with its sticky ends to each end of the um, cut plasmid here, and, and then DNA ligase, it can be inserted into that plasmid. Now because the gene of interest or the DNA of interest 
has been inserted in the middle of the LAC-Z gene, or in part of the LAC-Z gene anyway, LAC-Z is no longer functional. So we've knocked out the LAC-Z gene. We've knocked it out because there's foreign DNA inserted in it. And therefore, if this, this is a recombinant plasmid, this is, so we've, we've made recombinant DNA here. It's a recombinant plasmid. And this recombinant plasmid contains our gene of interest. Now, if this, if we, 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 if we do this, um, this restriction enzyme cutting and ligation, we would have a population of plasmids in our, in our microfuge tube. And we're doing this all in a, te a little test tube. And we would have a population of plasmids. Some of those plasmids would have our gene of interest inserted in them. But others, most in fact, would not have our gene of interest inserted in them. And they would have an intact LAC-Z. The LAC-Z gene is just fine. Note that both these plasmids have intact ampicillin resistance genes. So then our population of plasmids could be used to transform bacteria. And most of our bacteria would be transformed by a plasmid that had an intact LAC-Z gene and the ampicillin resistance gene. And Though most of those, the colonies then that would be grown from our population of bacteria that have been transformed by this mixture of plasmids would, when grown on a petri dish, produce blue colonies in the, these are blue colonies, in the presence of XGAL. And if our petri dishes also contain ampicillin, and they contain XGAL and ampicillin, then um, these, the colonies that have picked up bacteria will grow on, uh, on the petri dish due to their ampicillin resistance. But plasmids that have not incorporated our foreign gene, our gene of interest, will turn blue in the presence of XGAL. However, the rare colonies that have incorporated a plasmid that has the gene of interest cloned into our plasmid at, by insertion into the LAC-Z gene will, on the petri dish, grow because they have ampicillin resistance, so they will grow due to ampicillin resistance, but they will be white because the LAC-Z gene will have been knocked out and will not produce functional beta-galactosidase, and therefore in the presence of XGAL will not produce a blue precipitate. So the uh, presence of ampicillin here is to select for only those bacteria that have incorporated some plasmid, and that, but that plasmid could be either um, non-recombinant plasmid or recombinant plasmid. And, and, and in these cloning procedures, only a, a minority of the, uh, only a small percentage of the plasmids will actually be, re have recombined our gene of interest into them. So the first, uh, we don't want just any bacteria to grow on the plate. We want bacteria to grow on our petri dish that have incorporated a plasmid. And that is what the ampicillin resistance gene is doing for us. However, if we uh, uh, then a stain, if we produce XGAL in our, we, we, we put XGAL in our petri dish, that will allow us to distinguish those bacterial colonies that are derived from bacteria that have incorporated our gene of interest, our DNA of interest, from those bacteria that have just the, the regular plasmid in them with the intact LAC-Z gene. So these white colonies then are the ones we would pick and grow from in order to obtain cloned copies many billions of copies of our gene of interest because they, these bacteria would harbor our plasmid, which is recombinant. And in that way, we can select, in a way, the needle in a haystack from the population of plasmids that are present in our reaction. We can select the rare ones that have incorporated our gene of interest by knocking out the LAC-Z gene. And, and that is a cloning technique in which plasmid vectors can be used to um, clone a particular gene of interest. And you'll see that this technique has relied upon two things. One, it has, re had has relied on insertional activation of a reporter gene so that we can detect um, the recombinant plasmids by in, in act inactivating a particular gene. In this case, we're inactivating LAC-Z in the recombinant plasmid. And also, we're looking at the, the selectable markers. That is, we're selecting for a marker. In this case, the marker gene is a resistance gene for a particular antibiotic. So we use both of these uh, selectable markers and insertional inactivation in order to identify colonies of bacteria that harbor our gene or DNA of interest. Now.
much of, of biotechnology relies on being able to select for rare events and, find, and, and pick out DNA that is rare in a large population of DNA molecules. We've just seen that in our uh, uh, cloning scheme here. But um, often you want to build a collection of DNA molecules that represent a population of molecules from a particular organism's genome. For example, that would be called a genomic library. And, and we can use plasmids to build DNA libraries in which each plasmid might harbor a different fragment of DNA from a source of interest. So let's imagine, for example, that this is, we've cut DNA from a genome. So we've, we've basically isolated genomic DNA from an organism. Then we've cut it with restriction enzyme. So here we have genomic DNA. And so we have represented in the millions and billions of fragments of DNA in our test tube, we have different fragments of our genomic DNA. Well, we can randomly insert that into bacteria, uh, into bacterial plasmids, each plasmid harboring a different fragment of the genome. And then we can transform bacteria with those plasmids, they incorporate those plasmids, so that each cell basically contains a single fragment of the genome in it. In this case, we're using genomic DNA. You can also use other sources of DNA that aren't genomic DNA. We'll talk about uh, complementary or cDNA uh, shortly. So if we have a population of bacteria then, a, which is, uh, would consist of millions and billions of bacteria, each one harboring a unique fragment of the genome, we can then um, use that library, if we can fish out of that library a particular fragment of interest. Let's say that this is our gene of interest, and we want to study that gene. Well, we can, we can um, probe that library with our gene of interest and isolate that fragment of DNA from our genomic DNA. And you might be wondering, you might be wondering and say, well, if you already have that gene of interest, why would you make a library and then fish it out again? Well, let's imagine, for example, that you are studying a gene of interest and um, you would like to isolate the genomic DNA of an individual to see if that gene of interest has been altered in any way by determining its nucleotide sequence. And um, just because you're studying that gene doesn't mean you, can, you automatically know what that gene is like in every individual. So you want to isolate an individual and determine what that gene of interest looks like in that individual. Well, then you would isolate genomic DNA from that individual and build a library, in this case a plasmid library, and then you would screen that library to find out the colonies that had your gene of interest from the particular individual whose genomic DNA you made the library from. So in the example we've just looked at, we've examined generating a genomic DNA library, but other populations of DNA molecules can be used to generate libraries as well. And I'd like to focus right now on uh, a population of molecules called cDNA. As you know, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which in eukaryotes is processed into mRNA. And we can isolate mRNA from different organisms or from different cells within an organism to obtain different mRNA populations. And those mRNA populations isolated from cells can be, trans can be reverse transcribed into DNA. So using the enzyme reverse transcriptase, RT, we can convert RNA into DNA. Now normally, that's with the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Normally you think of DNA um, encoding RNA. In this case, RNA encodes DNA by the action of this enzyme reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase was derived from viruses, mammalian viruses, that have RNA genomes. So these are RNA viruses that have RNA genomes and that produce the reverse transcriptase enzyme in order to produce DNA molecules, which can be inserted into a host chromosome. That's part of the infection cycle of these RNA viruses. But we, in biotechnology, we use the reverse transcriptase to make DNA copies of RNA, and we call that DNA that is copied from RNA complementary DNA, or cDNA. And so we use reverse transcriptase to, as, to uh, we apply that to our RNA templates, which can be a population of RNA molecules derived from a particular cell, let's say. 
And then we can destroy the RNA template with RNA degrading enzymes or RNases. RNase is an enzyme that degrades RNA. And then we're left with single-stranded DNA. And then using DNA polymerase, we can produce a, a double-stranded DNA molecule using our single-stranded DNA molecule produced by reverse transcriptase as a template upon which to synthesize a second strand of DNA. So in this case, then, we have produced double-stranded complementary DNA that is complementary to a particular RNA molecule, which was um, subject to transcription by reverse transcriptase. And if we are dealing with a population of mRNA molecules, then we can produce a population of cDNA molecules. And those DNA molecules can be cloned into a library. So we can produce a DNA library that consists of cDNA. And that library, for example, could be from um, one cell type, cell type A, or another cell type, cell type B, for example. And um, in that way, we can study the mRNA populations that were present in these cells A or B, because we have produced a cDNA library uh, from the RNA transcripts that were present in those cells. So note, in this case, we're making a library that does not represent an entire genome. It only represents those parts of the genome that were transcribed into RNA and therefore produce cDNA in our reactions. Now, it, um, let's talk about a technique that is used to screen libraries. And that, li that technique depends upon a, the ability to hybridize DNA with probes. So if we have a gene of interest, let's call it gene of interest, we can label that gene can label it. I'm indicating labels here by asterisks. And that the label can be a radioactive label or it can be a fluorescent label. Uh, it can be really a variety of, of labels which will allow us to follow this gene of interest. And that gene of interest or that DNA of interest can be used as a probe. So what we produce is a labeled, a labeled probe. That's misspelled. A labeled probe. And that, that label allows, allows us to track that probe DNA. And something that we need to talk about is that we can use probe DNA to hybridize to target DNA. So if this is our probe DNA, which is labeled and made single-stranded, so we take our double-stranded probe DNA and we make it single-stranded probe DNA, we can then hybridize it through hydrogen bonding, Watson-Crick hydrogen bonding, to target DNA that is also made single-stranded. Target DNA. And it will hybridize there, and in that way we can detect whether a particular DNA is present in a population of molecules or is absent. So this technique is nucleic acid hybridization. And it relies on our, it, 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 it um, is based on our ability to use Watson Crick complementarity to, uh, to query DNA populations as to whether or not they have um, they, a particular DNA fragment is present or not, based on whether the probe will hybridize to it or not. If, the, if target DNA is not present, then the probe will not hybridize to it. And the probe DNA will only hybridize to DNA sequences uh, for which it is complementary. And this, is, this technique of, of nucleic acid hybridization and using labeled probes is essential if we are to screen libraries, for example, or if we are to apply um, the detection methods to other applications in biotechnology that we'll talk about. So it's important that you understand nucleic acid hybridization. So let's look at how we would screen a cDNA library for the presence of a particular uh, target DNA using labeled probe. And, and therefore screen the cDNA library for the presence of um, an original mRNA transcript that would have been present in order to produce complementary DNA, now represented in our library. So let's start out here. We grow colonies of, of plasmids from our library, each colony derived from a single bacterium harboring a sim, single recombinant plasmid. It could be complementary DNA, for example. And then we can pick up, we can make a replica of that of the colonies by picking the by um, by placing a filter, a nylon 
or nitrocellulose filter on the petri dish and bacteria will be picked up by that filter and now we have a replica of our particular plate um, on a filter and that and and we can plate out many many plates and obtain many many filters representing a um, uh, representing our library and then those filters can be um, treated in such a way so that the DNA within the colonies of bacteria here are made single-stranded so they will serve as targets for probe DNA and um, so we break the cells open and denature the DNA and then we can um, probe that that filter with a labeled DNA probe and only colonies only DNA from colonies that has target DNA in them will bind our probe. So in this example, we're showing two colonies, for example, that have our target DNA in them, and therefore our probe DNA will hybridize to them. And in that way, then we can, using our, our detection of our probe, whether it's a um, colored label or a, a radioactive label, we can determine which colonies on our original plate or plates in, in practicality, you're, you're screening many, many, many plates. You can determine which colonies have had d target DNA in them by virtue of your probe recognizing the target DNA and hybridizing to it. And then you can go back to your original plates and say, oh, I would like that colony because I know it has my target DNA in them, in it. So in that way, for example, if you had a gene of interest that you could obtain a labeled probe for, you could probe a library, a cDNA library, let's imagine, in our case, and find out and find the, the colony of bacteria that had plasmids in them that had the complementary DNA to the gene of interest. And then you can study that complementary DNA to see um, what part of the gene was actually transcribed into messenger RNA, because that is what complementary DNA is. So this is a, the, the method we would use to screen libraries, and it relies on nucleic acid hybridization with labeled probes. Another technique that relies on hybridization uh, of labeled probes is the detection of particular fragments of DNA in a population of restriction fragments. So we can separate DNA, as you know, through gel electrophoresis, and then we can make a replica of that gel by placing the gel uh, against a filter, again a nitrocellu nitrocellulose or nylon filter, and we can blot the DNA pattern of fragments in our gel onto that filter by placing it in a solution that will wick up solution through the gel and onto the filter. And then we can probe that filter with labeled probe DNA. And our probe DNA will only hybridize to restriction fragments that, uh, to which it is complementary. So in, in that case, our labeled probe will identify in our original gel fragments of DNA that are complementary to our probe DNA. And this technique is called southern blotting. This is called the southern blotting technique, so named after E.M. Southern, who invented it. And here's an example of um, a, a detection using radioactive labeled probe DNA of particular DNA fragments in different restriction digests of different DNA. Wherever you see a dark band here, you have had radioactive emissions from the probe, and that means that the probe is hybridized to a particular target fragment. Not all fragments uh, are detected by the probe, of course, because the probe only hybridizes to DNA fragments, um, target DNA fragments to which it has complementarity in a Watson-Crick hydrogen bonding fashion. Now, this application of southern blotting has been enormously important in biotechnology, and we can, we can examine one application of that technique by looking at the application of it in forensic analysis. So here is um, an example of um, detect, detecting differences in DNA fragments produced due to changes in the DNA sequences. So let's imagine that we have an original DNA sequence here, and a restriction enzyme cuts at this point, this point, and this point, points A, B, and C. In that case, we have, um, in this case, we have two fragments produced. We have this fragment, we'll call it fragment A. So here's fragment A, and here's fragment B. A and B, produced by our restriction digest. Well, if we run those out on a gel, 
and use a probe that spans this region. The probe will detect both fragment A and fragment B because it has complementarity to both fragments. And we could detect that on um, a blot of a gel, for example. So this would be fragment B, and this would be fragment A, B being smaller than A, and therefore migrating faster in the, in the gel, and therefore um, represented on our, on our blot by our detection using our label probe. Now, there can be changes in this original sequence due to point mutations, due to changes of single base pairs into other base pairs, in which case, if that happens in a restriction enzyme recognition site, that site has its nucleotide sequence changed, and therefore, the restriction enzyme that we're using will not cut there anymore. In this case, we produce just one fragment. Let's call it fragment Y. So here's fragment Y produced by digestion of this changed DNA sequence. And on a gel and southern blot, we would only detect fragment Y in this case if we used a probe, the same probe which spanned this region. So our, our labeled probe DNA. So it detects any DNA from, to which it is complementary, and that in this case is only fragment Y because there's no restriction site here anymore due to a point mutation. Also, there are other vari variations in DNA sequence that don't, aren't single base changes, but rather if this dark blue area represents a repeated sequence, a repetition, um, changes in DNA can occur so that we have variable numbers of these repeats. So the, we would call this a variable number of the repeat. And in this case, our probe DNA, if we, here's our probe DNA here, we digest our DNA with our restriction enzyme. Here we'll produce fragment Z, let's say, and fragment, this is fragment B. This is the same fragment B that uh, we obtained up here. So in this case, we've produced a change in the DNA that is not due to a single point mutation, but a change in the DNA that represents a variable number of repeats. And now, let's say we have fragment Z here and fragment B produced by our restriction enzyme digest. We run that out on gel and probe with labeled DNA. We see that we have our same fragment B as before, but now we have fragment Z. And comparing fragment A here with fragment Z, we see that Z is longer than A and therefore migrates to a slower, at a slower rate than A did up here. And so we see a different pattern of restriction fragments in our gel due to this variable number of repeats here. We detect not the AB pattern, but the ZB pattern. And in this case, due to the point mutation, we don't have an AB pattern. We have a Y pattern. So this technique then can be used to identify changes in DNA that have occurred by point mutations or by variable numbers of repeats. And in applying this to forensics, we see here samples taken from suspects of a, of a, in a rape case and um, um, samples of semen taken from the rape victim, so from the crime scene. And so you can take crime scene DNA and compare it to suspect's DNA. In this case, using the uh, probe, which will detect um, variability in DNA that is very variable in the human genome. So almost every individual has a different pattern of restriction fragments produced in this particular area. We call these hypervariable regions. So what we have here is the victim's DNA. And here we have a, a detected with a probe, digested with the restriction enzyme, and detected with a probe. And here we have the, our probe detecting a particular pattern of restriction fragments in the suspect. So this is the suspect DNA. So we have a suspect, we sample their DNA by taking a blood sample, isolating DNA from it, and uh, digesting it with restriction enzymes and probing it with uh, a labeled probe. And here is crime scene DNA. In this case, the crime scene DNA is not that of the victims. It has a different restriction pattern, but matches the suspect's pattern um, exactly. In this case, the suspect is guilty. This is a guilty suspect because 
their DNA matches that taken from the crime scene. Their, their, the suspect's DNA matches that taken from the crime scene. And so we can place the suspect at the crime scene. Here's another example. Here is the victim's DNA, here is crime scene DNA, and here is a suspect's DNA. And in this case, we see that the suspect's DNA matches the crime scene DNA exactly. And provided that you are using the examining a region of the genome that is hypervariable, um, then the chance of this pattern coming from someone else in the population is very, very small. And this technique has been used to convict uh, criminals of, of crimes. And this is a forensic analysis. I should mention that this technique has also been used to exonerate uh, individuals who have been in prison because their DNA does met, not match crime scene DNA. And this is for a variety of crimes, not just rape. So uh, biotechnology has been very useful in forensics, and it's a good example to show the applicability of the techniques that we have been talking about. So next we're going to move on to um, DNA sequencing, and that's where we'll pick up with in the next segment of this lecture and then finish off by talking briefly about uh, genomics, the application of DNA sequence, and the revolution that it has brought about in genomics, the study of genomes.